It is Palm Sunday, as Pastor Dan has said, and I'm going to give you a message today that's not very Palm Sunday-ish. How about that? Um, no palm branches, uh, no triumphal entry, um, you know, no uh, coming from Jericho to Jerusalem. I'm going way back to the beginning today, and I want to talk to you about an attitude that should arm you in the best possible way uh, appropriately for Easter, Easter coming up. Easter is next Sunday. Can you believe that Easter is next Sunday? It's seven days away. Uh, I don't really like um, Easter in March. I prefer it in April. Um, nobody asks me, so we just roll with it. It just seems like it can't possibly be here. But it's the one day where we have the chance to focus on, to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, something we should be doing every day. But I mean, we make it public. And uh, that's going to be a great day. But today I want to talk to you a little bit about the attitude that will take us into Easter in a way that honors Christ. And I've entitled the message, Accidental Pharisee. Um, and I hope that'll be clear to you in just a minute why we've called it that. We're gonna go all the way back to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Now, for those of you who know who Jesus is, Jesus is God. He was born a man, 100% God and 100% man. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect and sinless life, experiencing everything that we've experienced, but yet did not sin. He gave himself up on the cross, allowed himself to be crucified. Three days later, rose again, defeating sin, Satan, and death once and for all, so that anyone who has a relationship with him, who's confessed sin, believes who Jesus is and asks for him to be Lord and Savior, doesn't have to spend eternity in hell and a life of no meaning or meaninglessness, but we can know God, have purpose, and spend eternity with him in heaven. And um, Jesus, in for about three years at the end of his life, from the time he was 30 to uh, 29 to 32, 30 to 33, he had something we call a ministry. Um, that's a very um, Christian word for it. He started talking. He started telling people what he was about, what the point of the kingdom of God was about. And what he said is the kingdom of God is at hand. And it's good news for all people because he came to bring peace between us and between God for people who aren't necessarily churchy kind of people, for people who had never considered themselves to be religious people. He said, I came for you and I came to forgive and I came to heal the distance, the broken relationship, to reconcile you and God. And people were gravitating toward his message, some people, and some people were mad at Jesus already about six months into his ministry, this three years, and wanted to kill him. And he was in Nazareth at the time. Nazareth was a town that used to be Jesus' hometown. And he was preaching this message. He'd cast out some demons. He'd healed some folks to accentuate the message. And there were people who wanted him dead. And they were conspiring to kill him. And so Jesus, he wasn't on the run, but he did move from place to place. It wasn't God the Father's timing for him to give up his life yet. He moved to Capernaum. And Capernaum was his new home base. That was what he was going to call home and spent a lot of his time there. Four of his disciples at least were from Capernaum. Capernaum was a, a seaside town, a lakeside town, a big fishing town. Um, Peter, one of his disciples, apostles was there and lived in that town. And Jesus was teaching there and had spent just sort of another phase of his ministry. For some reason, people didn't wanna kill him in Capernaum, at least not yet. But, um, yeah, you know, there was still time and the plot was still thickening. So this is early in Jesus' ministry. And the Bible picks up in three different places, three different gospels tells this story. We have it in Matthew, we have it in Mark, and we have it in Luke. It tells this story, and it's one that may be familiar to you, but I want to break it down in a way that I think will be a little different and a little challenging for you, because I know it's certainly been challenging for me. It's the story of the paralyzed man who was let through the roof at the feet of Jesus. If you have been with me, if we've been together for years in 2017, it was my first year here as a pastor of, at the church, I preached a series called Dirty Church, and we used this passage, and we broke this down over four weeks. So this will be a little different, a little different way to break it down, but could be familiar to some of you who've been around a while. The Bible simply picks up and it says to us that one day Jesus was teaching and the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law were hanging out. They were sitting there. And um, it's a weird sort of a way to, to begin a, a story, but the Pharisees were the bad guys. They were the religious elite. Many of them were trying to control everyone in church. 
by their rules and their regulations. Some of them intended to pass down their power from one family to the next. And we've seen that trend, unfortunately, continue in churches from generations since then, where it seems that in almost every generation, somebody adds something to the gospel that's either cultural or traditional and weaves it into the fabric of the original message of Jesus. And it becomes part of a denomination, of a church group, of a religion. And every time that we weave something into the gospel that's cultural or traditional, making it a non-negotiable, it becomes an obstacle for somebody who's trying to find faith. And the Pharisees were masters of the obstacle. As a matter of fact, they were professional obstacle creators. They would look at you and try to find reasons why you're not good enough to be here, why you shouldn't be sitting here, why the gospel's probably not for you, and why you probably aren't gonna be able to understand the message in the first place. They were dividers, not uniters. They were separators. And Jesus had already had enough, even though it had only been just a few months into his official ministry. And um, I just want to point out to you that they were part of the crowd that was listening to Jesus. Now, Jesus was at the center of this home. And you'll see as I unfold this story, as we unpack it, that this was a home, probably a large home, and there was a crowd, probably a large crowd. And Jesus was at the center. And Jesus should always be at the center because the way we make sure that we're centered is by using him as our bearing point. Now, what's that mean? That means that in my walk with Christ, I don't compare myself to you and try to be better than you. My goal is not to look better than you, to act better than you, to be more Christian than you. My goal is for us to grow together and I only win if we win. You only win if the person next to you wins. We're a family, we're united and we grow together comparing ourselves to Jesus, which frees us from a lot of the traps that we see mentioned over and over and over through scripture. So I am for you, I'm not against you, and I'm not looking to divide you or separate you from this church family. I wanna unite you because the message of Jesus is uniting. Now, sometimes it's difficult to hear, but when the gospel is difficult to hear, it must always be because of the content. Deny yourself and follow Jesus, not the obnoxious way that sometimes we represent it. And so I want to talk to you for a second about how the crowd can be dangerous. Now, the crowd was uh, consisted of at least three different types of people, groups. One would have been the Pharisees and Sadducees, the keepers of religious tradition, the church leaders who would look at you with a side eye, wondering what you did last night, whisper about you and talk about why you probably shouldn't be here. You get the point. Another group were just the gold diggers. They were the ones that just wanted something from Jesus. They wanted the miracles. They wanted the healing. They wanted the food. They were just, they were in it for the show. And then there were part of the crowd that really wanted to hear the message. It was too good to be true. And they wanted to understand it. The disciples were there with them and they were crowded around Jesus, who was the what? He was the center. Jesus has to be the center. The Pharisees loved the boundaries and would judge you by the boundaries the social things, the traditional things, the legalistic things. But Jesus was the center. In Matthew 23, Jesus gave a discourse. Um, they're called woes to the Pharisees. And I don't mean woe like woe to a horse. I mean woe like pronouncing judgment on them. A whole chapter. And out of this chapter, I have summarized a few things that we need to be mindful of because if we're not careful we can become an accidental Pharisee. The tendency for Christians as we begin to grow in our relationship with Jesus is to compare ourselves to each other, to try to be better, to try to win. We can become religious and fall in love with an organization or an ideology, even fall in love with the text, but we forget who and what the text was designed for and intended to do. So from Matthew 23, I just wanna start us off with some warnings, with some questions to make sure that none of us are sliding down the slippery path of the Pharisee, because if so, we are a danger to Jesus' ministry and his message, and we're full of empty religion, and we've missed the point. There's still time to course correct. So let's take a look. 
One day as Jesus was teaching, the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there in Capernaum, probably at Simon Peter's house, although we're not 100% for sure. The questions that I want you to ask yourself are, are you one of the Pharisees sitting there? Let's begin with this question. Am I becoming more authentic in my walk with Christ or am I just trying to look spiritual? Do you know anybody that um, is in your life who when you're around them, you act differently? Is there an inconsistency when certain church people are around, whether it's a grandma, a mother, somebody you went to church with when you were a kid, somebody maybe from a different generation, somebody from a different denomination, someone from a different school of thought, and you have your church friends, you have your really churchy friends, and then you got your friends you can just be yourself around? Well, my question is, are you able to be yourself around everyone in your life? Or are you managing impressions and managing relationships? Trying to appear more spiritual in front of some than you really are. Because according to Jesus, the Pharisees were pros at looking good and adapting. And they could say brother and amen and all things work together for good and quote scripture and walk right past you and tell you they're praying for you. But at the end of the day, there was nothing going on because looking spiritual, this legalistic form of religion isn't enough to captivate the human spirit. We instinctively know that it's not enough. So we get bored. We step back, we ask questions. The second question that I wanna ask you that comes from Matthew 23, right off the bat here as we separate and divide this crowd in the best possible way to understand is, am I in my life becoming more judgmental or less? Am I becoming exclusive or proud in my life? Now, you've probably started implementing some spiritual disciplines in your life because we've talked about them the last few weeks. And the tendency for you and for me as we begin to grow in our walk with God is immediately to wonder why such and such is not growing the same way we are. So you look at your wife and you say, if you were spiritual like me, you would be studying your Bible and using the pastor's 2 Timothy 3.16 outline. And she might look at you and she might say to you, well, if you were spiritual like me, if my husband walked with God, he would be praying according to the Lord's prayer outline that Pastor Rick gave us. And, and you can begin to look at other people and wonder. And usually when we do that, we judge them on what we're good at and we don't have all the information and we don't see what's going on in their lives and, and where their heart is and we become judgmental without all the information. Don't you hate that when somebody judges you without knowing you? But you and I do that all the time. Whenever you enter a group, whenever you meet somebody new, is this my kind of person? Are they a lot of work? Can they add something to my life? Do they have something to offer? Or do I need to stay away? Should I keep them at arm's distance? Have you ever been a part or to a church that where when you walked in, you felt like people were looking at you and like you just didn't quite fit? Nobody told you you had to go to men's warehouse and get a haircut and cover your tattoos and everything else that some churches have made so important because the boundary issues, the social and the traditional become so much woven in to, to our practice, to our Christianity, that some don't know where truth ends and the rest begins. And so we judge people and we become exclusive. And the worst is we become proud. Do you think you're better than somebody? What's your trigger? What criteria do you use to evaluate the world around you? Number three, am I more approachable as I walk with God, as I am a Christian longer, am I more approachable or am I less approachable? Now, this is an important one. Because um, we as Christians should be the most approachable people in the world, even with people who we vehemently disagree with ideologically. We can have strong opinions and we can stand for the truth without being obnoxious and polarizing. And in the political season that we have 
coming up, there's probably no more temptation that we have than to mix our political views with our faith, to become dogmatic, to exclude people from our lives. And if we're not careful at the end of the day, we find that the only people that are around us are a small subset of the population that look just like we do, that act just like we do, that talk just like we do, that dress just like we do, that vote just like we do, and nobody else cares what we have to say because we're irrelevant. We're the masters of our own little community. And Jesus was the most approachable person on the planet. If you don't believe me, read the gospels. People who weren't like him at all liked him because they knew that he saw them and he got them and he proved that he loved them. When I started ministry, good gracious, 30 something years ago, that was a long time ago. I've been doing this since I was 19 years old. I was a youth pastor at 19 little tiny church uh, in the country. And since then it's been church ministry. And, and my first full-time church was a church. It was a big church, about 7,000 people. At least that was according to the guy who counted. I don't know. I never counted. Uh, and we had a bunch of staff, like 17 full-time staff members. And when I was brand new, I uh, wanted to learn how to you know operate as a staff member in this environment. I was in my early to mid twenties and Everybody else was a lot older than me and it was a kind of a big time situation according to things that were important to them. And uh, I wanted to be able to blend in. And I'm like, man, I got to figure out how to do what these guys do, these pastors. Now, this was back in a day when churches did something that we don't do anymore, at least most churches. Um, if a visitor came and they were naive enough to give their home address to the church, somebody would show up at your house on Sunday afternoon or on a Monday night during Monday night football and they would knock on the door and they'd be like, hey, I'm from the church. I wanna talk. And, and you know, back then at a different time in a different place, culturally, some people didn't mind. Now it's a bad idea, in my opinion, all the way around. If you give us your address, we're not gonna contact you. No one's gonna show up at your house unless you ask us to. Um, we respect you and we respect the boundaries that we assume you have. Back then, we were expected to go and make visits and every single Monday we were handed out cards, blue cards with visitors information on them and it was divided among the pastors and we had to go and drop in at their house. And uh, I wasn't very good at it and when I did go, took me a long time to go. And so there was this music pastor who was really good. And um, music pastors are always like the, the epicenter of, of all problems. And I'm, I'm just teasing with you. They're not. We got a great one. Ash, Ashley and Daniel and Brian, they're great. Uh, but um, he was, I mean, he could knock out 12 cards in an afternoon. I'm like, how do you do that? How do you stop by? How, what, what do you? And so he said, drive with me, come with me. I'll show you all the secrets. And um, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. So I got in his car and we took off and he goes to the first address, right? That was back before we had like Apple phones and you could just GPS it. We had to like use a map and we got there and he pulls up in front of the house and checks the address. He goes, yep, right address. And then he stops and he shuts his eyes for a second. And then he drives on and he made a couple notes on a card. And we got to the second house and I'm like, this is weird, you know? And, and he stops and shuts his eyes for a second and he drives on. And he did this at the third house. He did the exact same thing. He stops, he looks at the address, checks it, makes sure he stops and shuts his eyes for a second and he makes some notes on the card. And I said, dude, what are you doing? And he goes, oh, this is easy. He said, the way I do this is, is I write down my notes on the card and turn them in and everybody's happy. And I said, well, what do you write down? And he handed me a card and this is what it said. Stopped by, had prayer. That's what it said. So literally he was telling the truth. He stopped by, shut his eyes, had prayer and drove on. And he was the visitingest pastor you've ever seen in your life. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't just stop by and have prayer and move on? He approached us by becoming part of us and it wasn't brief and it wasn't ethereal or artificial or super spiritual. He came and he stayed and he connected and he loved and he died and he rose again and he proved it. Am I becoming more approachable or less? Usually it's when I allow the tangentials, the tangents, the negotiables to become non-negotiable 
and nobody wants to be around me because I won't stop running my mouth. Perhaps you know someone like that or maybe you've fallen into that trap. All right, picking up the pace here. Am I growing tired of pursuing spiritual growth? Because if you're growing tired of it, you're making it a job. And this is not a job. It's a lifestyle and it's fun and it's freeing if you do it right. Now there is some discipline as I've talked to you about because nothing good in life happens without discipline. There's some things that we make ourselves do that we may not want to do necessarily. And if you do them over time, you become a different person. Part of that is spiritual. We've talked about these things, but it doesn't make you weary. It energizes you if you're focused on this and not this. The boundaries, the traditional, the cultural, the legalistic, that stuff will wear you out. But the center is where you find life. And everyone in this house was focused on Jesus who was at the center who was giving a message, I am for you. And if you follow me, I'll lead you to freedom. Well, am I measuring my growth in superficial ways? That one may be self-explanatory. The Pharisees in Matthew 23 were bragging about keeping every single little detail of the laws that they'd made up. They were exhausting and obnoxious but maybe you are keeping a to-do list, a checklist. And if someone were to say to you, how's it going between you and God? You give them all the things that you do. How many times you've been to church, right? How many times you opened your Bible? How many times you prayed? And those are all helpful things in your growth, but those aren't things that determine or indicate how healthy your walk with God is. Maybe they would be things, depending on your tradition or where you're coming from, that you don't do. And some churches just staying away from some of the social no-no's make you look like you're growing in your walk with God. And so you might give a list of things that I don't do. Here are the things I do and here are the things that I don't do. And if we're measuring our spiritual growth in supernatural or, or superficial ways, we're missing the point. And Jesus, his message was very simple. Are you becoming more loving toward God? And are you becoming more loving toward others? And if you are, you're avoiding the trap of the accidental Pharisee and you might be living your purpose. Now, I have a lot, to more, a lot more to say about this and we'll do that in a few minutes. Okay, so as we continue the story, I just wanna be clear about one thing. And that one thing is that when I'm talking to you about Jesus being the center, uh, it's not just a turn of phrase. It's not just a spiritual cliche. Um, it really is the question that you have to ask yourself and the question you have to answer. Are you willing to let Jesus Christ be the center of your life? Which means that everything else in your life has to move outside of the center. And Jesus being in the center now has control of every single thing that you have going on. Your past, your troubles, concerns, hopes, accomplishments, your career, where you think you're going to be tomorrow, where you hope to be in 10 years. Because making Jesus the center brings with it the choice to trust him and to say, I don't know what's best for my life. Even though I think I do, I don't really know. You know, and so my life belongs to you. You do with me what you want. And Jesus was offering to do with our lives what he wants and promising that what he wants is so much better than anything you or I could want but you have to come to the conclusion if that is in fact the way that you want to live. Because just like Jesus told his disciples when he said to deny yourselves and follow me, that's the invitation that he makes. But it's not a bad thing. It's the best thing. But we have to decide. So 
you have the crowd. And all we've done so far is just intro the story where we have a group of people who are gathered at a house and the Pharisees and the Sadducees are sitting there waiting for something to happen. So if we were listening to the story and they said Pharisees and Sadducees were sitting there, we would all go boo, right? Because they're the bad guys. We don't want to be them. We don't want to accidentally be them, but we need to make sure that we're not a part of this next um, group or this next section in the crowd. Let's pick the story up together. The crowd can be a distraction and not just a danger. They, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the rest of the crowd had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came, four to be particular. And how do I know that? Because this is mentioned three times and each time gives us more detail, never conflicting, but always in addition to or complimenting. Some men carrying a paralyzed man on a mat tried to take him into the house to see Jesus who was at the center. And they could not find a way in because of the crowd. So the crowd was there crowding around Jesus. And there was a man who desperately needed to meet Jesus. And the crowd chose not to see him. In Jesus' day, paralyzed people were inconvenient. Now, Jesus loved people and he did not find paralyzed people to be inconvenient at all, but society did. Anybody that had anything physically wrong with them, they assumed they had sinned or their parents had sinned. There was some kind of a cosmic spiritual karma where you had it coming, that they probably deserved it. And so the religious community of the day would have seen a paralyzed man, these Pharisees and Sadducees, and not wanted to get near him because they didn't want to be defiled by him and would have judged him and said, you should have been better or your parents should have been better. You probably deserve it. How, I mean, that's just heartless, but that's the way they were. They were considered to be sinful and they were not very good at spiritual survival of the fittest, which is the way of the jungle back when Jesus entered the picture and his ministry began. It was cutthroat. It was ruthless. And religious people ruled the day. But the crowd, the ones who were in it for what they could get, but also the ones that wanted to hear the message, they didn't see the man who desperately needed to come to Jesus. They can be distracted and you and I can be distracted too. As a matter of fact, this is where you and I are gonna identify with this story probably more than any other place because I know how distracting life can be I live the exact same, well, in the same world and a similar life to you. And the distractions are all around you. Your schedules are full. Some of it we do to ourselves. Some of it we allow to be done to us. But we schedule the margin out of our lives where we are running at 100 miles an hour. And what's worse than that, we're dragging our kids behind us with no room to stop and no room to breathe and no room to experience, no room to evaluate, no ability to see. And the world has a plan for your life and it's to keep you busy and distracted so you miss out on what's important and what's real. And I've been a sucker and you may be being a sucker to the world system, but Jesus was offering a way for it to stop. And it's easy for us to get so distracted that we literally just don't know what's going on around us. And we're tempted to say not knowing is an excuse, but there's a much different reality and we'll take a look at that. Sometimes we say, I don't know, so it's not my fault. But it really is our fault because our choices reveal the condition of our heart. And there are some ways when we know that we're just too distracted to be any spiritual good. And one of those ways is that when we just can't see the people around us, when we become easily irritated at everyone else in our life and explain it away when we crowd 
everyone out with our own preoccupation of our own experience. When I attempt to schedule everyone and everything that could be or should be important, when I literally schedule it out of my life. And the crowd, the church, may not be dangerous because we work really hard not to be accidental Pharisees here at Capital City Church. But I would say that we probably fall under the category or within the trap of oftentimes being distracted. And you're gonna see four people make a break from the crowd and do something that's really unusual, that's really courageous, and that indicates true spiritual transformation and that in fact, Jesus Christ was at the center. So let's pick the story up and continue to look at the scripture together. Well, they couldn't get in because the crowd kept them out. So these four friends picked up their paralyzed friend, which by the way, paralysis in this story represents spiritual need and physical need, somebody who needed Jesus. They picked him up and they walked up to the rooftop of the house. Now, architecture back in Jesus' day depended on how much money you had, probably a lot like it does today. And some of the really small houses were just little squares and they had thatch roofs with um, straw woven in and some mud and you'd fall right through. It wouldn't be very easy to walk on that roof. But then wealthier people would have a very large room, sometimes some bedrooms off to the side, maybe a room out back for the animals. And up on top of the house, they would have a porch or a patio that would have ceramic tiles. And the scripture in another place in the gospels uses a word here and literally says tiles. The tiles were being removed from the roof because the four friends climbed up on the roof and lowered him through the roof, taking him straight to the center to Jesus. Can you imagine? being in a worship service. And all of a sudden, debris starts falling from the ceiling. And I keep talking because I'm pretty good at talking through distractions. And I pretend nothing's happening. And more debris falls from the ceiling. So I'll look to Pastor Jared, right? What's going on? Something's happening. And he may run up there in the attic and try to find out you know, what's going on. And then I look back again and I see a face looking down from the ceiling. And then all of a sudden a huge hole. And then a man on a mat being lowered down to the center. Four people who circumvented the dangers of the church, who went around the distracted congregation and said, there is nothing we will not do to get our friend to Jesus. And when they looked at their friend, they saw the need. Here's an important thing I wanna tell you, because you have friends in your life who are spiritually paralyzed and you may not have seen or noticed their need. Spiritual eyes see spiritual need. And Jesus tells us that he will give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear. If we ask for them. So the man was lowered through the roof by his friends and laid at the feet of Jesus. And the Bible says that when Jesus saw their faith, which is a really curious thing, not just the man, but the four friends, Jesus was moved. And he said, son or friend, your sins are forgiven. And he healed them. And the Pharisees grumbled. Who is this man who thinks he can forgive sin? And 
in Matthew 9, Jesus is talking about the crowd. Now, in Jesus' day, it was the crowd that he saw. In your day, it's your crowd. Could be your family, could be your friends, could be your coworkers, could be people who play sports with your kid. It's the people who you see every day or the people who you come in contact with a lot. This is your crowd. When Jesus looked at his crowd, the Bible says that he saw them as harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Now, they didn't look harassed and helpless. They weren't riffraff dragging themselves out of the, I mean, they, they were normal people with jobs and lives and kids and families and hopes and dreams and everything else. But Jesus had spiritual eyes and spiritual eyes see spiritual need. And he saw a paralysis of the soul. And he saw them as harassed, as beaten down by sin and Satan and separated from the truth, helpless. Without this center in their life. And then in Matthew 9, Jesus was moved with compassion. And then he throws up his hands, I think. And he says, the harvest is so plentiful. There's so much spiritual need, but the workers are so few. There's just so few of us who will see with spiritual eyes. So I'm gonna ask you to do something. And it's a big ask. It's a lot, I get it. But it's important. You ever have a friend or family member, God forbid, spouse, probably not, somebody in your life close to you who when you talk and say anything, they end up figuring out a way to make it about themselves. You ever have anybody in your life like that? I mean, they just figure out a way. It doesn't matter what you say. You can say, I got a speeding ticket on my way to work today. And they'd tell you something about themselves that totally turns the conversation back about last time they got stopped by the cops. And you were like, I thought I was talking about me. You could tell them, you know, I've got a cold. And they would find a way to figure out how to loop all the way around and turn the conversation and make it about them. It doesn't make any difference. You could tell them that you want a million dollars and they would figure out a way to make the conversation about them because some people in your life can just do that. Does anyone know or have been around anybody like that? I'm not asking if you're sitting next to them. Just tell me if you know anybody like that. I can't raise my arms because I'm not sure. I've been sweating for two services. So I'm just gonna keep my arms down by my sides. But you, a few of us know pe people like that, okay? Here's the deal. We are people like that. And we're like that at Easter. Because the conversation at Easter should not be about ourselves. Kids are part of it. Easter egg hunts can be part of it. Brunch with the family can be part of it. Dressing up can be part of it. But we make the conversation about ourselves. And I'm gonna ask you to do something that's really hard. And I'm asking you to do it on a day that should be in theory easy to do, but the way we practice is gonna be really hard. And I'm gonna ask you to ask God for the gift of spiritual eyes. And I want you to look at your crowd and I want you to see if there is someone in your crowd who needs to see Jesus. And then I want to ask you if you are willing to join the four friends who will stop at nothing to make the introduction. Now, it's going to be hard because it's counter to our human nature to be others focused. Super counter to our human nature to be others focused on a holiday but I would ask you to remember what the holiday is all about in the first place. Would you invite somebody to come and sit next to you next week at Easter? I promise you, as your friend and your pastor, I will do my very best to see them, to respect them, 
to communicate the truth of the gospel and the hope and the meaning and significance and future that comes from confessing sin and believing Jesus and trusting him. And I'll do it as best I can, but that's not the important part. The important part is that the Holy Spirit of God will take the message and allow it to land in somebody you care about whose life can be changed, whose marriage can be changed, whose parenting can be changed. Some cases, generations of dysfunction can be changed. And all it takes is for us to be willing to take a break, to step away from the crowd, but it's hard. Let me tell you why. First of all, inviting somebody to church, and by the way, statistics show that like 80% of people who come to church, they come because somebody invited them to come, which is a great statistic. But when you invite somebody to church, that means you actually have to be here to, sh to meet them when they come. And I know, now listen, I'm not judging anybody. Do not, that's not me, I love you. I am grateful you're here. If you're a one time in six months kind of a person, I'm grateful for the one time. Let's work on that because I want you to be here, you know, more and more. But I mean, I love you. I'm not judging you. But when you invite somebody, you have to be here. And for some, that's tough because instead of planning ahead, you just sort of make it a game time decision. I got a notice on my phone this morning at about seven o'clock that said, Ankeny is expecting snow soon. And I'm like, oh man, there's going to be some people who look at that and go, I don't have to go to church today. And I'm like, God, I want everyone to hear this message. I mean, it just happens, right? I get it. So it would mean that you have to be here because when guests come and you invite them, they don't like it if they're here and you're not. And the second thing that you have to do, and this is really hard, I'm not looking at anybody. I'm looking at everybody. My head's on a swivel. You don't not only have to be here, but you gotta be on time. See, my eyes are shut. They're shut. I'm not, I'm not I promise, I'm not making eye contact with anyone. When you get here late, I'm happy you're here. I'm thankful that you were able to make it. I know showing up is 80% of success. It's hard. When you have kids, it's even harder. I see you coming in looking like you've been at war. I know Sunday mornings are tough. I'm happy. But when you invite somebody, you got to be here on time because guests usually arrive on time. And then they sit here and they look around and they go, I don't think anybody comes to this church. And then pretty soon they're like, oh, good. Yeah. So, but it takes a while. So that, that's tough. I understand. It's a hard ask. The third thing I'm asking, and it's difficult, especially on Easter, even when it should be easy, is that when you have somebody with you, all of a the sudden their experience and their ability to hear the gospel and to make a decision about Jesus is the most important thing to you. So you'll see everything different than you see when you're only worried about yourself. But it means that you have to be willing to be others focused and to share their experience instead of demand your own. And I understand that that's a big ask. But is it too much? To ask God to give us eyes to see, spiritual need, to have the courage to break away from the crowd and to say, I will not be distracted. Perhaps to find that friend, to make that invitation. Then it's up to the Lord to do the work in their life. But hey, you can lower them through the roof. if you will. This is a great story. And I find myself many times as part of the distracted crowd. But this year could be different. And my prayer has been and is that you and I together allow ourselves to be used by God to do something really special this year and change some lives forever. Father, thank you so much for my friends who are here. And as we see this crowd in this story whittled down from the legalistic and judgmental Pharisees to the distracted 
and preoccupied crowd, to the faithful four friends who had spiritual eyes to see spiritual need and stopped at nothing for their friend to be introduced to the center to Jesus Christ. I pray that we do not demand that the conversation be about us this Easter. That we allow it to be about you and about others to honor you and your sacrifice by being part of what it is you called us to in the first place. We sing this last song to you to just tell you we love you, to tell you thank you. We look forward to Friday as we meet together here and celebrate the last supper with a communion to talk about the crucifixion of Jesus. Father, we look forward to Sunday morning as we celebrate the resurrection saying thank you doesn't seem like enough, but we're gonna say it anyway. And I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.